Going at the uh, Classic Gaming Expo 2005, Howard. Well, Classic Gaming 2005 is another good year. I mean, you know, we're coming along again. It's, every year is pretty cool here. I'm certainly enjoying myself. It's always fun to come out and see everybody say hello, see all the familiar faces and some of the new faces. And, uh, you know, I love to show more people, you know, once upon Atari and spread the word about what gaming was, which is very different from what it is. Cool. Do so you mind if we ask you some pretty randomized questions there today? Random away. Okay. What is the status of your uh, Yars 2 project? Well, Yars 2, at this point, I'm going to start talking to Atari and see where they're at, see if they're interested in something like that. I have a number of developers lined up already who are interested, so I think, you know, this could be very interesting. I've had a game designed for quite a while for it that I think is going to be very compelling. It's going to be the same level of action and, uh, you know, intense strain that you get in Yars Revenge, only in a very different format and with a paddle controller. So do you have a 2600 and a modern game in the works, or is it, uh, or is it one of them? Just 2600. Okay. Because I remember one time you said you had a concept, uh, like an idea to also make a modern game out of it as well. Uh, thought about that, about making a Yars well, 2. Well, the, the game concept that I have for, uh, for Yars 2 would work on any platform. It can be expanded for more capable systems, but the basic play it's a fundamental play concept, you know, like a Tetris kind of thing. Okay. It's another kind of game play, and you can do it on any platform, but it's just fun. Instead of being an immersive world, it's just a fun game play that I think will be very compelling, and it's very good multi-multiplayer action. Would, would it be able to be released as a ROM for the uh, 2600 emulation, or would it only be for sale? It could absolutely be a ROM for 2600. It could be a downloadable game for computers. It could probably even be done as a uh, HTML web capable type of game. It's a very flexible design. Cool. And um, just on the, the thought of uh, game design, what would, what would be the difference between someone having to design an action game and an adventure game for the 2600 console? Well, that's a very good question. That's a very good question because there's, there's a fundamental difference between designing action games and adventure games. And to me, the fundamental difference is that a well-designed action game uh, the designer should be able to have exactly the same play experience that players do. You know, I don't think a designer should have any advantage in, the, in an action game when it's done. It should provide the same experience for all players. An adventure game, it is impossible for the designer to have the play experience of the average player. Because when you're doing a puzzle game, you have to know the solution to the puzzle to be able to put it in the game. And if you know the solution to the puzzle, you can never get the real experience of trying to discover the puzzle. So whereas with an action game, the designer can genuinely play and try to enjoy the game and evaluate the experience of the game firsthand, in an adventure game, it's all projection, it's all imagination. I will never be able to know what it's like to discover the things I've already invented. So it's much harder to gauge the experience of a player in an, act, in an adventure game than it is in an action game. And I always found that a very interesting dichotomy. And is that also similar to like the text adventures where they would invent all the puzzles and you'd have to solve them, but they also could never really get the same experience as you moving through the cave and um, trying Absolutely. to, Absolutely. Know... I mean, if, 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 the, if the object is to solve a puzzle, the person who creates the puzzle cannot have the experience of the people who are trying to solve the puzzle for the first time. Okay. And maybe a couple of speculative questions. Uh, what do you think would have happened if Nolan Bushnell had never actually sold Atari, like if he knew somehow what was going to happen? Well, it's an interesting idea. I, it's my belief that if Nolan Bushnell had not sold Atari, Atari would have gone on to exactly the same success that it did. I don't think Atari's success was based on the things that Warner did. I mean, Warner definitely made Atari very successful, but I think what Atari had done was establish and launch a new genre of entertainment. And I think that was all set to catch on. So whether or not Nolan would have sold Atari, I think the seed had been planted and video games were about to explode. And had he not sold it, I think he would have just made a hell of a lot more money. Is it possible that if he hadn't have sold Atari that, you know, maybe they would have done even better or maybe they would be uh, competing with PlayStation right now or something like that? Well, if you go back and change history, anything is possible. <laughs> you know, so it's hard to say where it would have gone. Yeah. Uh, another question on uh, pretty much game designing. Uh, given the boredom caused by the corporate business model of uh, pretty much uh, 
keeping with what's safe or uh, you know going with what's already works what do you think the future of gaming will be like as, as it seems from right now well the future of gaming looks pretty dismal in some ways except that there will be occasional stars but isn't that really the way it always was in the beginning it was all about finding new gameplays and that was the excitement I mean for me and the people who I work with the excitement was creating something new and unfortunately with the what I call the marketing inversion that's occurred what happens now is people are spending so much on investments in games they can't afford to gamble on new things so they pursue things they know will work therefore nothing really new or fresh gets made and it becomes harder to innovate so that's good for business bad for excitement so it's just kinda of like a business predictable business model or something in other words exactly yeah. that's what people want you know the investment is much higher it used to be people only spent you know under under hundred thousand dollars to make a video game now it can be over ten million and so the tolerance for risk in that situation is much lower and when you take out risk the first way you take out risk is by trying to pre-sell a concept and the only concepts people tend to pre-sell are the ones that are already out there therefore nothing new is going to get developed so what would you think that like innovation or creativity how could how would they be able to bring that back given the business model or is it possible well, it's definitely possible. I think if you look at uh, Grand Theft Auto, it's a great example of innovation. It takes an existing uh, model of how to do a game, and so it's still saleable on a familiar level, but the design approach is very different, and I think very exciting. So innovation is good. You're not going to see just a whole left field, total out of the blue kind of new concept. What you can still do is you can create very significant innovations on the way existing genres are approached or dealt with. And then you still have the familiarity, but you can also find some new compelling play that's exciting for players. The problem is people have to be good enough designers to do that. And there just aren't that many good video game designers. It's a hard thing to do. It's easy to make better technology. It's not that hard to make better art once you increase the technology. The hardest thing to do in a video game is come up with new game concepts because that's really what ultimately players are after and that's what they interact with. And there aren't many good game designers in the world. There just aren't. It's a hard thing to do. And so that's why you're not going to see too much innovation. It's a combination of trying to minimize financial risk and the fact that there just aren't many people who can do it. And uh, Howard, what are you currently working on now? Oh, well, I'm currently working on... I'm currently just uh, finishing off a documentary that's on a whole different subject matter away from video games. It's actually on the San Francisco BDSM community, which is the sadomasochism kind of a thing. And uh, I've discovered that there's a whole different truth, a whole different reality to what's going on inside that world than what I and I think most people suspect. And I just felt it was so different and so striking that it was worth a documentary. So I got another couple of months, and that'll be out by Christmas. That'll be available. That's going to be called Vice and Consent. And you can find that on viceandconsent.com. In fact, by the time you're looking at this, there'll probably be a promo at that uh, website address, and then soon the uh, documentary will be for sale. And I think that'll be quite interesting. Uh, back on a video game track, I am currently looking at deals. In fact, I've actually got a screenwriter at this point to do a Once Upon Atari movie that's going to be more focused on my experiences arriving at and going all the way through Atari and all the things that happened. Some stories, a number of stories that weren't, didn't make it into Once Upon Atari will be focused and featured in this movie. So that would be, that could be a very interesting project. That sounds pretty cool right there. Uh, and we and uh, back when you were working at Atari, or generally back in the arcade era, what, what were your first uh, favorite games that you liked to play? My favorite games when I was playing games and working on games were definitely Defender and Robotron and Millipede. I think Eugene Jarvis was a kick-ass designer. There was a guy who really knew how to make a video game. And uh, like Defender and Robotron were two of my all-time favorites. And Millipede was, uh, was an excellent game. I really enjoyed playing that. You know, more recently, I think Grand Theft Auto is one of the most innovative and compelling games there is. I think it has reprehensible theming, but it's an excellent, excellent playing experience in a video game. Okay. And a lot of lessons can be learned about game design from that game. Right on. Okay. And, and, and did you have a 2600 yourself after programming all day? Did you actually go home and play it? Uh, I did play 2600 games. You know, I like those a lot. You know, I particularly enjoy, I thought Missile Command was an excellent job. To, the truth be known, I like Yars Revenge. I think Yars Revenge is a really fun game because when I made Yars, 
I was trying to make a game I would enjoy playing, and I really enjoyed that. I think that Asteroids is a very good 2600 game, and I think Kaboom is an excellent 2600 game, and Warlords. Warlords, I think, was an excellent 2600 game. Okay, and that was, that was mentioned in Once Upon Atari, too, right? The uh, Carol... Once Upon Atari covers a lot of the favorite games of the designers and the people who were making them. Okay. That's in episode four. And, uh, and when would the might the movie be out, or is that just still in the works right now? The movie now? would be a couple of years from now. That's just starting off. And since, the, since your video shows just the pretty wild stuff that was going on at Atari, and since Atari went complete, is there any company that you see that comes even close to that kind of environment today or other place you've worked at after? No, I've worked in, in and out of video games for 20 years. There is no company that has come anywhere close to what the experience at Atari was. Atari was a unique once in a time, you know, once upon Atari. That's all there was. It was just one time where this thing happened and it happened at Atari in the early 80s. And you know, there are, what I, what I find is interesting is that there are a lot of people who think they're in an environment that was like what Atari was. And then when I show them Once Upon Atari and show them what it was really like at Atari, they go, oh, I guess this really isn't like that. I mean, people's standards have become a lot more conservative. Things that were going on at Atari were extreme, totally wild. And so even people's concept today of what seems to be a little out there or a little crazy just, is, just doesn't measure up compared to what th was going on at Atari back then. So any other uh, juicy Todd Fry stories that weren't in the movie by any chance? <laughs> Speaking of crazy and, you know, no, wild. No, really there. crazy stuff that Todd Fry did is totally, totally covered pretty completely in Once Upon a Atari. I didn't hold anything back with that because Todd was a great character and his antics are definitely characterized and portrayed in full living color. Yeah, I thought Once Upon a Atari. Watching that, the, when the part about him walking down the uh, hallways, the sprinkler lebar. Oh man, that was like one of the funniest things I've even heard in a long. It's <laughs> a long an amazing time. story. You just don't see <laughs> things like that happening anymore at you know at oh, companies man. these days. But Todd was there. Todd literally ended up in the hospital and on an accident report. They wrote programmer injured while climbing the walls. And on Steven Spielberg, is he any revision on the theory? Is he still an alien, or is he just a clone? I, I really thought Steven Spielberg was part of the alien advance team to culturalize this planet to prepare to receive visitors. And I think what's happened is that the window is closing. You know, Steven Spielberg comes out with War of the Worlds. I don't think the aliens are trying to nuzzle up to us right now. So it may be a few years before that contact gets made. Okay, and my last question, could you tell us a little bit about the creation of uh, Saboteur? Saboteur was the last game that I was doing. It was finished, pretty close to finished, uh, just when I left Atari and things sort of really fell apart at Atari in the, about 84. And, uh, but what has happened is that the game has re-emerged. I mean, people found ROMs of it and put the thing together and it's very interesting, you know. In some ways I'm very proud to think that even 20 years after I left Atari, they're still releasing my games. So there's a part of that that's pretty cool. I mean, I was always the only programmer at Atari whose every game that Atari released was a million seller. And now I'm still releasing games 20 years later. So there's a real sense of pride and satisfaction about that for me. And on Saboteur, would, would, is it better with a, I ain't getting no plane, Mr. T-Head, or is it better with the real Saboteur? Uh, Saboteur was designed to be Saboteur. It wasn't designed to be the A-Team. It was retrofit to be the A-Team when they bought the A-Team license, but Saboteur is better as Saboteur. That's where the storyline was, that's what the backstory was about, and what I did with Saboteur was my first chance to get back to just pure original gaming, and I was trying to do a game that action-wise was even superior to Yars Revenge. And it was uh, several action scenarios in one game, and I think it was pretty compelling. I mean, I've seen write-ups of it online that say it's the best 2600 game they've seen, you know. I wouldn't make that claim, but I, I think it's in the top five. <laughs> it's a fun game. Cool. What, what's your mission on the, um, on the bonus level? Like, are you trying to uh, break through that barrier, or are you trying to shoot that barrier out of the way? On the bonus level, you're trying to shoot the barrier out of the way and clear it out. As soon as you clear that entirely, because that's a conveyor belt of stuff they're using to make uh, you know, their own weaponry that you're trying to sabotage. You are the saboteur. You've got to disrupt the, you know, the production of the enemy. So what you're seeing there, that what you're thinking is a barrier, is actually a uh, that's a production line, and you're trying to eliminate everything on the production line. 
Yeah, I got wasted by that, uh, <laughs> that barrier every time I played it so far. There's some complicated obstacles on that level. I tried to make that a very... Uh, what I try to do with an action thing is pull your attention in several directions to distract you to make it harder for you to avoid the threat. And that level is a real tour de force on that level. Cool. All right, well, thanks a lot for doing this interview. And just for all us gamers out there, I mean, you're, you're one of the most classic authors out there with the uh, I mean games that we all played uh, Christmas time when we were little kids you know Indiana Jones and the uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark ET I mean all those ones that everybody knows so uh, thanks for doing this interview oh thank and, you very uh, much yeah. I really appreciate the opportunity alright okay well hopefully we'll see you another time then I'll be looking forward to it okay